Hello, ladies and gen gentlemen around the world. Welcome to another episode of Round the Fire with Momo. Today we have Amber Wentworth on. Amber, thank you for accepting to come on my show. And well, if someone is in the carnival community, most probably they know you. But for those who might not know much about you, could you give us a... a short or long I, I really don't mind if it is a long introduction uh we've got all the time uh so could you please provide uh, an introduction of yourself absolutely first of all thank you for asking me to be on i'm honored absolutely. um yeah I'll, I'll try to condense this a little bit um i I am a nutritional therapy practitioner and I specialize in sugar addiction. That's kind of where my passion lies after figuring out that everything that kind of happened in my past was due to the underlying root of sugar addiction. So that has become my passion to help others deal with this same issue. So that that's my main focus. But um, I've struggled since about the age of three with some major stomach issues like chronic constipation. Let's go ahead and just get right on out there and talk about poop. But um, <laughs> I, I, I had it so bad. It was so bad as a young kid that, that I would bust vessels under my eyes. And um, it was just awful from the strike. It was just awful. Anyway, I struggled with that for 40 years. And um, it wasn't until I discovered keto that I was kind of like, wow, digestion doesn't have to feel like that. What? And then I moved into carnivore and I was like, wait a minute, this is what good digestion is. I'm so confused. I, I thought that it, it, it was normal to be bloated, to be, you know, gassy, to have cramps, et cetera, these kind of things. No, no, actually it's not. It's common, but it's not normal, nor is it healthy. So that was kind of like a big eye-opening thing for me. But we'll just kind of go back a little bit just to kind of give an indication of, of what my life's been like. So I had the stomach issues, all that kind of stuff. At the age of eight, I was um, went in for a bunch of testing to see if I had an ulcer. <laughs> And I did, I did at eight years old. Yeah, that's wonderful. So I had all these kind of issues. And back then I was a weird little kid because I loved vegetables. I couldn't get enough of vegetables. I mean, I did eat meat here and there, but I really wanted vegetables. And one of my favorite, and I'm cringe now, spinach. Oh. Yeah. Knowing what I know now, good God, how did I not have kidney stones or whatever else I could have had? Because I ate so much of it for breakfast. I wanted spinach. Now, of course, you know, as you grow up, you, you move on. I got into the, the, you know, cereals, Captain Crunch and Fruity Pebbles, Cocoa Pebbles. Oh my God. That was like, you know, that was the world to me. <laughs> and so that's what I kind of grew up eating, honestly. And so by the time I was 10 years old, I realized that my body was different than other girls' bodies were at that age because I had already started to develop. Maybe I had a little bit more weight on me, but I mean, compared to kids today, I was not a fat <laughs> kid. Okay. That that's was so mind boggling to me is that I was made to feel like this big old fat kid because I started to, to develop. Anyway, that kind of got me in the mindset that there was something wrong with me something very wrong. And, and it just morphed into various different things. And I had eating disorders. I was a full blown bulimic and anorexic by the age of 15. And, uh, at the age of 17, when I graduated, I weighed a whopping 98 pounds, which I mean, you know, I'm only five, two, so I'm not a big person, but still the thought of weighing that now, oh my goodness. Um, so I, 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 I did things like I abused, um, diet pills and back in the eighties, Oh, we had some good diet pills. I'm not even kidding you. They are outlawed now, but, uh, I, I had access to all of that, even as a teenager. So I did that. I did laxatives. I did diuretics. I did it all. I abused it all. I tried everything. I, I tried every single diet out there and lucky. The one thing I do have going for myself is that I have this crazy willpower. So I could willpower my way through anything. And I always achieve my goals, always. Never did I not achieve my goal when I set it. But the very next day after achieving that goal, guess what? I spiraled down because I could not continue to eat that crappy way that left me miserable, hungry, and angry and depressed. 
I couldn't continue to eat that way. And my willpower eventually just could not hang on anymore. And so I would gain all the weight back again. And this yo-yo, good Lord, it yo-yoed for so, so many years. I've lost 80 to hundred pounds four times in my life. And those, those were my big chunks, but I also lost, you know, 20, 30, 50, whatever pounds throughout all this time. I can't even, I'm sure thousands of pounds worth, worth of loss and gain in the 40 years that I struggled with this. And again, my eye-opening thing was when I found keto and I didn't have to be miserable. I felt satiated. I felt good. So many issues went away. I got off almost every single medication except for one. And I had just a little bit of my rosacea left over. Everything else was taken care of. I was no longer pre-diabetic. I no longer had, you know, super high blood pressure. I, so many things helped. And then when I discovered carnivore and a friend kind of, you know, pestered me into trying it. And so I did. And that's when all my stomach issues went away that I didn't even really understand. I still had because they were so much better on keto. Now I'm off all medication. I feel amazing. I don't have any issues. So now I advocate for this kind of lifestyle and trying to help people deal with their sugar addiction, because that is what I completely believe was the, the underlying issue that, that caused a lot of this. And it probably started when I was like three years old. So, you know, back, back way when, yeah, I guess that kind of summed it up a little kind of. Mm -hmm. Sure. And there are some things to, uh, to uh, unpack there. Let's start with uh, how you discovered keto. Are you, I mean, I remember from the other interviews with you that you got the exogenous ketones mm -hmm. and it worked for you. Could you talk uh, to us about the effects of exogenous ketones and how similar sure. they are to the sure. ketones that we make? <laughs> Absolutely. Now, see, this is a very loaded topic because in my community, oh my God, you are just a witch doctor if you talk about these kind of things because it's just expensive pee. Okay. Here's the thing. I do 100% believe that ketones, exogenous ketones do have a place. Now, can your body make ketones by itself? Absolutely. Do Is that what I do? Absolutely. However, Back when I was first introduced to it, I didn't even know what it was. I didn't know what ketones were. That's not something I ever remember learning in school or in any classes I took in college. I, I, I didn't really hear about this. Why? I don't really know. Either that or I just didn't pay attention. I don't know. But um, I, I didn't know about the ketogenic diet. I, I, I didn't know about fat for fuel. You know, it's all about carbs. You need all this, you know, the bottom of the pyramid, all this wheat and crap, you know, grains. Oh my gosh, eat lots and lots of that. That's what fuels you. Right. And so I had that attitude and I was in a place at that point where I was way over 245 pounds. That's just the last weight that I know of. It was more than that. I was miserable. I had high blood pressure. I had um, prediabetes. I had rosacea. I had Raynaud syndrome. I had severe acid reflux. I had all these issues and I was depressed. I was so depressed and I had tried so many different diets. I had lost the weight and gained it back so many times. I was, I was at the point of giving up. That's where I was. I was ready to throw in the towel and say, screw it. I'm going to be fat. I'm going to die young like my grandmother. And it's just my genetics, just deal with it. Ooh, okay. So my daughter actually had a friend who was selling exogenous ketones. And at that time, I didn't know what it was. I just thought it was a diet thing. Like the 50 other million things I tried, the slim fast shakes and all that mess, you know, I figured it was the same kind of thing. And she, my daughter, not that she needed to lose weight, but whatever, she decided that she was going to try this because her friend was, you know, kind of doing this thing. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to give it one more time. That's it. One more time. And then I'm done. I'm just done, done, done. I'm going to, you know, weigh 800 pounds and never leave the house again. Okay. So I tried it. And the first time I tried it, I was like, holy hell, what is this feeling? I, I don't, I don't know what this feeling is. And my husband is looking at me all weird. And I'm just like, I don't, I, I don't know how to explain this to you. I feel so euphoric. I feel like for the first time in many years, I see color. My gray world is now colorful. 
And that's the best way I could describe it. And he's just looking at me like going, yeah, there's something, Whoa, there's something really going on there. And at that point, I, I was like, what in the world is this stuff? So I started researching it and I was like, good God, these ketone things, the, this is amazing. And the more I started finding out what it was and what it did, you know, it, it just, it is just like this wow factor. And then when I found out that I could produce the ketones on my own, what, why hadn't I heard about free. this? Yeah, it was like this amazing drug that is your body needs, should have, you know, that that's not this bad taboo thing. It's actually a thing that your body does, but we've been so, you know, conditioned to believe that the way we're eating is the correct way that we don't even know how to experience this phenomenal feeling. And so that's when I was like, oh no, we have got to get the word out about this whole ketone thing, you know, but okay. Going back to the exogenous ketones, what I will say is if I had not tried that product, I wouldn't have been where I am today. So I am eternally grateful. I think it's a very awesome thing for certain people and in certain situations. And I'll kind of go over what I feel. Now, this is not something that I just would recommend my clients. No, it's not because I know how to get them there easier. However, for certain people who majorly struggle, who don't, who are in the situation like I was in, where I was so unhealthy and I was so depressed and I couldn't get out of my own way. Having that in the very beginning, the first couple of weeks or whatever, maybe a month, I don't know, it really helps because number one, it gives you the electrolytes your body needs. So you don't have to mess with that part of it. So you're not going to have all these horrible things. I had zero issues transitioning, zero, none, zero. And I think that had a huge, you know, difference for that. The other thing is it suppresses your appetite. So I wasn't miserable. I wasn't miserable. And then the other thing it does, it gives you energy. So you, you have the ability to take on things where before I didn't have the energy. I didn't have the health. I didn't have the right frame of mind. That's the other thing. It like really boosts your mood. So by doing this, because my body wasn't able to do that yet, produce the ketones, my body is just not, wasn't fat adapted. It wasn't, you know, used to using fat for fuel. So I wasn't there yet. So having that transitional piece I think made all the difference in the world for me. And I think for some people it does. Not everybody, not everybody needs to do that. No, I'm not saying that at all. But there are some people who I feel would really benefit from that. Uh, then you have the people who, who do it for therapeutic reasons because they really need their blood ketones to be higher. It's not, it's not the same thing as producing ketones on your own. Okay, no, it's not. But it does give your brain that extra boost to be able to, uh, you know, do whatever, achieve your goals of having higher ketones in a therapeutic mode, you know, like if you have, you know, epilepsy or you have some mental conditions, people who, who are, are really struggling with mental health, a little bit of boost to ketones can help. Even if you're producing your own, sometimes that little bit of extra really helps. And the other situation some people have found to be very beneficial is taking the ketones kind of like a pre-workout. Mm -hmm. So in those three circumstances, I feel that, you know, exogenous ketones can have a place. Now, again, like I said, that is not something I recommend very often. There's very um, certain situations where I'm like, you know, you might benefit from this. But most of the time, you know, you're able to get a client to the place where they can produce their own ketones quick enough to where that's not an issue. I hope that answered the question. So um, does it also have a kind of mental encouraging effect that if I do a ketogenic diet, that's the place I'm going to get. And can it play a role in, in that way? Heck yeah. <laughs> because, you know, just taking that product and, and understanding what the ketones made you feel. Oh my God. I mean, that was like, oh yeah, I want that. Oh yeah. 
Yes. I want my body to produce all that, that yummy drug, you know, whatever you want to call it, the happy thing. And so, yes, I mean, again, if I would have not have tried that and I just heard about this one other diet, this keto diet, I probably would have gone, Ugh, it's just like everything else. I'm just too tired. I would have not have tried it. And it is really mm, interesting to know that when your body's mainly a sugar burner, you still can, and you are, you still haven't changed anything about your diet. It can still work. So it doesn't mean that your blood sugar has to be low. And I always, uh, I was always skeptic of exogenous ketones. And uh, this was one of the big reasons. That, uh, and I was like, if your body has sugar in it, would it go to the ket ketones? Because it's, you haven't changed the food and it's really interesting story and opened my mind to it maybe for some family members uh it would work because i've been talking about uh, uh keto carnivore like a like an evangelist to them all the time but it has no had it has had no effect maybe if they try it and see how it f feels to have ketones in your body yeah. and the fact and they when they learn that they can make it themselves it can yeah. be a good encouragement it was for me i can't speak to for everybody but i do think if you don't understand what that feels like and i didn't you could have described that to me and i'd be going eh, yeah okay whatever but i experienced it myself and that's when it was kind of like whoa you know <laughs> rainbows it was awesome oh. And you mentioned that you were bulimic and anorexic um, in very young, at a very young age, at the age of 15 or so. Mm -hmm. um, something that I am still trying to understand is that uh, are these conditions uh, a result of the pressure of the society or are they something that people experience because of the in foods that we normally eat or is it something from within that rather than without like social factors is it something psychological from inside uh, as someone who has experienced it which one of these uh, or combination of these do you think is the factor is the okay influence? yeah that that's a, actually a really good question and i think that there are multiple answers to that there's not a one set thing that necessarily um oh this is exactly what it is for everybody no um for me and this is something i've honestly just recently understood the past like year year and a half something like that that my issues as far as the um food the you know eating disorders, exercise disorders was twofold. Number one, sugar addiction was the root cause of all this. And it was my way of trying to control my food because I was completely out of control at that point. And I didn't know what else to do. So when I understood, I had a friend who started doing the bulimia thing, you know, and I was like, huh. Hey, that's kind of cool. I don't have to give up anything. And then I still purge all the calories. Right. So I thought it was kind of a cool idea. So once I, I, I started it, I couldn't stop. It was very, it became like this, a, another addictive thing. And that was part of my addictive personality that I now understand, but it also did not help. Like when I talked about when I was like 10 and started to develop and the girls would make fun of me because they were super flat chested. And I mean, not that I was big chested, but you know, I wasn't flat like those 10 year old girls were. And I was only five foot or I don't, I, well, I'm, I don't know how old I was, but like I said, I'm only five foot two now. I was always like the second shortest in the class, never the shortest, but right there. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when you have this little, more of a little short body versus these long skinny bodies that are growing at the time, you know, it makes it even that much worse. Anyhow, um, I would get made fun of. And then of course, of course the boys kind of look at you, but at 10, you know, back then boys weren't quite as into girls as 10 year olds now, but, um, so I got a little bit of attention from the boys, but I got a lot of teasing from the girls and it made me really doubt my body that it, you know, and to think that something was wrong. Mm -hmm. And so 
I, I tried to fix it. And because I was being called fat and those kind of things, I translated that my problem is fat. And what do you do about fat? You go on a diet. And I would watch my mom do this constantly. You know, she was scared to death to be like her, her family who was very overweight. So she was always very cautious, always eating salads, low fat, everything, you know, how that all goes. Yeah. And so that's what I grew up with. And I would watch this too. And I now realize that my kids watched me do things too. And I'm like, Oh God, you know, <laughs> but um, you know, it, it's not an on purpose thing, but you do see how the people around you react. And so I had all this internalization going on. And then the fact that I was already a, a sugar addict at that point, and I, I couldn't control it. I, I couldn't do it. Uh, like, you know, when, it, when I hit my worst at the age of 15, I got my first paycheck. It was like 200 and something dollars. And this was back in the eighties. Like I said, that's a lot of money. Right. But it was, you know, how it, it takes a month and then you get a paycheck kind of thing. So that's why. And it was a summer job. I took that paycheck to the grocery store and I bought 200 and whatever it was, um, dollars worth of food, of food. Little Debbie paycheck. snack cakes, uh huh. The whole the whole paycheck. Um, it was mainly sweets, but there were a few other things. It was mainly like little Debbie snack cakes, um, ice cream, and I would hide all this stuff. And I ended up eating almost every single thing that I bought in one afternoon. I was at home by myself. My my parents were at work, and my brother was away from the house. So I sat in my room. And I ate and I ate and then I would puke and I would puke and then I'd eat and I eat and I puke. That was my lowest point <laughs> right there. That's when I was like, Ooh, yeah, I have a problem. But at that point, what am I going to do about it? I'm already in the midst of it. I don't know how to control it. I, I don't want to gain weight, you know, that kind of thing. I can't give up my food that I love. So this is my life. I tried the, you know, anorexic route, whatever you want to call, where I, I just stopped eating. I just stopped eating. And I couldn't, if, if I did accidentally put something in my mouth, I would freak, like completely freak. And then I would go and throw it up. So, you know, that that's kind of one of those things. So it, it just really depends, honestly. Um, I feel that a lot of people who have eating disorders, it is rooted in sugar addiction, food addiction. And that's just their way of controlling the uncontrollable behavior they have. That's how they try to rein it in. Now, that does not mean that everybody who has an eating disorder is a sugar addict. No, it does not mean that, but it does play a big part. And of course, you know, you do, I do believe that you have another thing that kind of hits with some of this is when you've had childhood trauma, like some major issues happen. And for me, right at that 10 year age mark, <laughs> along with everything else going on, my parents separated, or got divorced. And that was, that was my most traumatizing thing to ever happen to me until June when my mother passed. But that was like, so, so traumatic to me. And I think that that kind of really nudged that behavior. So I had the sugar addiction. I had the um, traumatic event and it just kind of morphed on through everything. And then I had this poor self-image. So I think it's a combination of things. I don't think we can just say, oh, it's, it's just all psychological or, oh, it's just all societal or, oh, it's just, you know, whatever. I, I think there's just so many pieces to the puzzle and we're just kind of starting to really understand some aspects of it. So. Yeah, the, you talked about sugar addiction, and that's definitely one of the topics that we, I'd like us to and get to. Well, uh, when we talk about addiction, everyone would uh, think about methamphetamine and o opioids and maybe alcohol, but mm -hmm. sugar mm -hmm. is the thing that yep. we're always eating. So, so many people would poo poo the idea that sugar can be addictive. And so what's your response to that? And for people who have sugar addiction, what is the solution? Okay, first of all, to the people who think that they don't know addiction, they don't get it. They haven't lived it. They haven't explored it. They, they don't get it. 
Now, back in 2011, the American Society of Addictive Medicine added food to their list of addictive substances. However, it was never made a big deal out of because that's when the opioid crisis hit and everybody was like, opioids. Well, I'm just going to tell you, and you can come at me if you want, prove me wrong, fine, I don't care. But I honestly believe that food, food addiction, the complications because of the food addiction has killed more people than all the addictions put together. True. Now, if you look at it, you know, you think, eh, well, food doesn't make you have, you know, uh, these, these, you know, withdrawals where you're shaking and you're vomiting and you're, you know, almost dying. You're right. It doesn't. Uh, <laughs> sugar addiction is a slow poison for most, but it is the most, it is the hardest and the worst addiction to have. And you can ask people who have other addictions like cocaine, like Eric Clapton. And when he was asked in an interview, oh, so it all started, your addiction started with cocaine. And he said, oh, no, 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 no. My addiction started with sugar. And the reporter was like, what? Uh, sugar? And he was like, yeah, when I was a little kid, blah, blah, blah. And this is the case, like a lot of people, they go from one addiction to the next. And the sugar addiction tends to be a primary addiction that can lead to caffeine, to smoking, to alcohol, to process addictions, to pornography, to whatever else goes on, uh, you know, cocaine, whatever it is. And you will find that with a lot of these people, it started with sugar. They just, you just don't really put the pieces together because it, it's just part of your life. It's just part of society. It's part of what we do. And plus you need food to live, right? That's the biggest thing I hear from health professionals. Well, it can't be addictive because you need food to live. Oh, oh okay. Well, let's back up for a second here. Pretty sure alcoholics need to drink to live too, right? But do they need to drink alcohol? Mm, no. Does that mean they don't have an addiction then? Hmm. We might want to re-examine that, you know, philosophy because that's kind of full of shit personally. And uh, I've had, you know, a discussion with a dietitian in an eating disorder clinic. And she just basically told me food addiction doesn't exist because you can't be addicted to something that you have to have. And I was like, actually, anything that hits that reward center of your brain can be addictive. Oh, so you're saying hugs can be addictive? Have you heard of sex addiction? Yeah. Have you heard of, you know, pornography? Yeah. It's kind of like one of those things that morph into to, to that because they're trying to mimic that same kind of thing. So yeah, actually, yeah, it can be addictive. <laughs> and so, you know, I, I just, for me, seeing the attitudes from so many health professionals is mind boggling after I guess what I learned, I probably would have thought the same thing. Matter of fact, I used to kid about, you know, oh, I'm a food addict and I didn't really ever believe it fully. You know, I just thought, oh, I have a character flaw. I just have a character flaw. I don't have enough willpower, even though I, no, I knew that was complete crap because I met every single goal I ever had that has to take willpower. Right. So obviously that's not my problem, but still the way that we do things in society is to blame the victim. That's what we do. So if you don't get the results or, or you can't maintain it or whatever, it's because you have a character flaw. It's your problem. Not maybe we've been given bad advice. <laughs> maybe we're not doing things like humans are supposed to be doing. You know, and I can't remember actually what your official question was. Did I answer it? Uh, yeah, the first part, definitely. Is it a thing and how to okay. control it? Okay, how to control it. Okay, this is a very complex um, issue to deal with. And it there is no quick fix and there is no permanent solution. This, once your brain has been damaged from repeatedly giving it a hit of the drug of your choice, whether it's food or um cigarettes or alcohol or drugs, whatever it is, it keeps hitting that reward center. Eventually damage is done. And when that damage is done, it's done. It's done. You've damaged your brain. You're done. You're, you're an addict. You're done. But you can rewire the brain. And so what recovery looks like is number one, obviously getting rid of the drug. 
that's kind of common sense, like an alcoholic, right? You can't keep having alcohol, right? It's not going to work. So you have to get rid of the drug. And yes, I'm sorry. Certain foods for certain people are just like a drug. It is period. It is. And if you don't have that issue, then you wouldn't understand. I, I get that, but it is in fact hits you just like any other drug. So that has to be removed. And yeah, sometimes it's a whole food group. Oh, oh my God. But actually it's more the processed food of a certain macro. It's not necessarily every carb is bad. No. Um, you know, some people benefit from vegetables. I don't particularly eat them any longer, but for some people it can provide you know, some benefit. That's all great. That's all fine. Sometimes fruit. Okay. But for an addict, fruit is kind of one of those iffy things, but you got to get rid of that. That's number one. Got to get rid of it. So there is no such thing as moderation when you're an addict. Can an alcoholic moderate alcohol? Can a cocaine addict moderate cocaine? No, guess what? Neither can a food addict. They can't, they can't, they can't. And this is a very hard thing for people. And this is where they get stuck. You mean forever? Well, if you want to stay sober, yeah, pretty much, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's just the reality. So that's where people just reject and they're like, nope, can't give up my, for me, I can't give up my banana. I can't give up my oatmeal. I can't give up my chocolate. You know, those were my things. I said those words. I don't, I, I don't eat them now and I'm functioning perfectly fine perfectly fine, but okay. So removal of the drug, and then we need to work on, um, getting nutrients to your brain, your brain requires amino acids and healthy fatty acids to function correctly. And with sugar, guess what? As much sugar as we eat as a society, it really damages the brain. It just really does. It's just not a good thing. And it depletes a lot of nutrients. It, it, it pulls them out, you know, it just kind of cancels them out, I guess is, is an easier way of saying it. So you have to really focus on good nutrition that's specific for the brain as well as the body. And a, one of my favorite things is to at least try the carnivore diet for 30 to 60 days because it eliminates all your trigger foods. It's up for some people who include dairy that could be problematic. So dairy, I always suggest get rid of at least for 30 to 60 days. And um, so you start, you know, feeding your body what it needs. And so it can heal and rewire. So that is 10% of the equation is nutrition and removing the drug. So diet, lifestyle. Then the next part is behavior changes. That's 40% of the equation. Okay. And this is the heart. This is very hard. For instance, what I mean by behavior changes, say that going to the grocery store triggers you to no end. Like you go, you find yourself going to the bakery department and you're sniffing bread and looking at the cookies and ooh, just drooling. Right. Well, <laughs> That's not a good thing, right? That That's just relapse waiting to happen. So you have to come up with a plan of how you're going to deal with that. You have to make behavior changes. So number one, you got to be sure that you're not hungry when you go to the store, right? Mm -hmm. And number two, stay the heck out of the bread aisle. Just stay out of the bakery area, right? If you know that's a trigger, stay out of it. And that has to you know, fast. Yeah, just boom, 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 yeah, you just go around it, whatever. And, and so you, you implement these certain things that, are problematic for you. You have a plan to be able to deal with it. So you're not just all of a sudden thrown into a situation to where you're like, eh, I don't know what to do. So having that part is really important. Another example, just so people can kind of understand what the behavior changes I'm talking about. Okay. Say you are going to go to a birthday party and you know, they're going to have that cake you love there because some person is putting on the party and that's their signature dish. And all you can think about is that you care less about the party or the people, the, the, whatever else is going on. You want that cake and you can't stand it. All you think about, well, that's a problem. <laughs> Number one, you don't want to not go, but some people, they do have to take it that extreme, but mm -hmm. you can do things again, like being sure you're not hungry. That's a big, big trigger. I mean, not that, that that's going to stop you from eating crap. No, but it helps. And then bring your own snack or food or whatever with you. If you feel you need to do that, just so you have something where everybody else is, nah, 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 you can kind of be part of that. So you don't feel left out, have a 
a statement ready if somebody inquires about what you're doing. Now, I'm not saying you have to justify what you're doing. Absolutely not. But it does make for an awkward social situation. So instead of saying, oh, I'm on the carnivore diet or I'm on this diet or I'm whatever. No, just, just say, well, I've been having some health issues and I am trying something different to see if I can feel better. So I am trying to avoid blah, blah, whatever. And just, just for my health. Well, okay. If, if you frame it like that, you're not going to get these slapback comments like, Ugh, it's just one piece of cake. Oh my God. Why are you so extreme? You know, because you're asking somebody to hurt their health. Really? It's a totally different thing. So if you kind of have those kind of things prepared, so you don't feel so, and then you end up giving in because you don't know what else to do. So those are some of the behavior changes. That's just some examples. Okay. And now the biggest portion of all of this is support. You can't do this on your own. You can't. You have to have some kind of support, whether it's a 12-step program like FAFAA. Um, I don't really recommend for food addicts to or sugar addicts to um, do the OA, the Overeaters Anonymous. It's kind of a different animal. But um, you need support somewhere. You don't have to do 12-step. There's so many groups out there. There's so many different programs. And some are free, some you pay for. But there's something for everybody. Find what works for you. And that's kind of the sum of it. But there is no quick fix. And this is a lifelong thing. You don't just fix it and you're good, you're done. You can go back eating sugar. It doesn't work that way. You have to stay on it just like an alcoholic does. An alcoholic doesn't just stop doing everything and think they're going to remain, you know, recovered. It, it doesn't work that way. So support is huge. How, how should this support work? And is it like what we see in NA or AA that when you have sugar cravings, you call a friend or how does it work? It, it works however you want it to work, whatever works for you. In the 12-step programs, I'm pretty sure that they do have kind of, I guess what you would call a sponsor or whatever. Mm -hmm. But not all groups necessarily have that, but you can buddy up. You can have a friend. That may be your support. Somebody who understands, who, who gets what actual sugar addiction is for real, not just, you know, kind of what you think it means, or somebody who's been through it or going through it, and you can buddy up with them that may be enough support for you. Everybody is a little bit different. Um, my support was kind of more family wise and a few good friends. And then I started joining some groups and kind of figuring out what's going on. But it is, it is crucial that you have support somewhere, whether it's your spouse or uh, Facebook groups. There's, there's all kinds of Facebook groups out there. I have one that I just started that I haven't done much with yet because I'm just kind of getting it up and started. But there's plenty of free stuff out there and people can bounce ideas off of each other. You can do Zoom meeting uh, meetings where you may have a subject if you talk about like, um, what's a good way to beat a craving or whatever? What are some supplements that help? Those kind of things. And then you can open it up where everybody kind of talks, kind of like what you see in AA, you know, like uh, this week I struggled with whatever. And then, you know, other people be, oh yeah, me too. This is what I did. Uh, you know, so you kind of feed off each other and understand number one, you're not alone. And number two, there are people who are successful that, that have been doing this a long time. So you, you feel like you're not this weirdo, like there's something wrong with you. And that's the other thing that I think people don't really understand. And I didn't is that, those of us that have these, what we call special brains actually would have been the ones who survived way back, way back when, you know, when everybody else is dying of various, you know, famine and et cetera, we would have been the ones to survive because of our brain. But now with the way things are, everything, we live in a dopamine nation. I mean, mm -hmm. everything is about dopamine hits. So we have all this food that's specifically designed to addict us. So if you already have the brain, that's, you have the special addictive brain there and you have all this crap that you're ingesting, it's going to affect you. That is not your fault. That is not your fault. Yes, it's your responsibility, what you put in your mouth, but what happens to your brain after you eat that food is not your fault. 
And it doesn't mean you have a character flaw. It doesn't mean there's something wrong with you. You actually have a really cool brain that is amazing. It's just, it's been hijacked and it's very sad. And so we look like we are the ones with faults that we have character flaws. I keep going back to that because I hear that so often and, mm-hmm. and it's just so, so wrong. It's so wrong. And I, I, I fell victim to that too, because number one, you know, I didn't really think of myself as an addict other than kind of joking about it. But when I would view somebody else like a drug addict, oh my gosh, they just haven't hit rock bottom hard enough. They just, they have no control. They have no willpower. It had nothing to do with any of that. It was, I have like a totally new view on addicts and it's, it's a heartbreaking thing because it's more of our society and what we've done that affects it. And yes, you have to have some amount of willpower. Yes, you have to have, you know, the desire to make the changes. Absolutely. Of course, of course, of course. But when you have this brain <laughs> that is constantly telling you to, you know, do this, whatever it is, eat this, do this, take this drug, drink this alcohol, whatever it is, it, it is very difficult to, to beat that. Not to mention the other part of your brain, the front part of your brain that deals with, you know, logic, decision-making, willpower, that's messed up because of the, you know, issue of the reward system messed up and the, you know, everything out of balance. So that messes that part up too. So you have brain fog, you've lost willpower, you, you've lost your drive. There's so much that happens. So you are already at a disadvantage. Then you have this addictive substance in your face constantly. Mm-hmm. It, it makes it extremely difficult. Yeah, you, as you said, it is not a personality f- flaw necessarily, and actually, we can say it is not because that freaking thing is a is an addictive substance. And I believe that everyone has their own uh, poison. For me, coffee was mm-hmm. highly addictive, and I got to mm-hmm. become a, a coffee drinker maybe when I was 25, 26. And before that, there was not almost nothing that I felt I was addicted to, but coffee was. So that thing is addictive. And maybe that thing is different from it for every person. But it is mostly that thing that mm-hmm. makes you addicted to it. And speaking of which... Uh, what do you think about coffee? What's your, uh, what are your views on coffee? I think I, yeah. I have some memory that you are not very positive on that. Well, you know, I don't really care. The problem is we've been told for a long time, you know, coffee is so good for you. Well, I don't really buy that because they're and Oh God, I'm going to get pushed back on this. I don't to tell you, but I, I don't completely poo poo on coffee. However, I do think that there are certain people that just really shouldn't do it. Just really shouldn't. If you are, well, if you are highly stressed, that the caffeine is going to really mess with you and it's going to jack your cortisol and and just really overflow that stress bucket so that is not a good idea if you have what i know people have a fit about this one especially in the the you know health professionals uh, adrenal fatigue okay call it whatever you want i don't care whatever you know don't get all hyper on the word but you get what i'm going from you know but if you already have that issue going on and then you dump in caffeine too, and you, you know, do all these other things like, you know, fast for too long and blah, 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 this kind of stuff. You're drinking coffee and you're fasting at the same time. That's, that's the only thing you do is coffee. You, you don't eat for, you know, 20 hours, whatever it is that can be really bad for certain people. And then like for women, depending on their hormonal issues, coffee, caffeine specifically, it's not so much the coffee, but the mm-hmm. caffeine. So in, anything with caffeine, that can, can be an issue uh, that can, that can, you know, mess with your hormones there too. Then there's also people who 
actually have glucose spikes from coffee. Now I did not, I tested on a CGM. I did not have that response, but there are people who do. It's a fact. Um, and I know people, Oh, well, it doesn't do it to me. Well, that that's great, but it doesn't mean it doesn't happen to other people. So it can potentially be a problem. I mean, if it works for you and you're getting good quality coffee, that's not the junkie buying grocery stores that are full of mold and other toxins, then, Hey, go for it. If it's your thing, whatever, if it gives you comfort, whatever, um, you know, go for it. I just really caution certain people to just be aware that coffee could be affecting them. It's not that I think, oh, coffee is the worst thing in the world or anything, but it can be potentially not so great for certain people. That's kind of where I stand. I personally don't drink it. I did, but, um, <laughs> and I did drink the cheap stuff, um, you yeah. know, Starbucks, whatever. Um, I did not buy the organic and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, I don't know, but uh, I, I don't drink it now because I do have a, a, a stress issue, a very high cortisol right now, just, just external stuff and probably some internal stuff as well. But um, so coffee for me, is just not a good thing. It's just not a, a wise decision for me. The same here. I can see people drinking the same coffee I used to drink. They wouldn't uh, have the same reaction I would. And they could drink it every day and not get a headache when they stop drinking it one, one day. But if I drank coffee for three days, the fourth day, if I didn't just happen to drink it, I would get headaches and the stress. I mean, when I got by um, organic coffee, Mm, yeah it just took longer for that to kick in but it eventually after one week it did and i would even get get nightmares oh so, yeah and th that was very interesting that i saw this pattern several times that after drinking it for one week maybe during the day i didn't feel that much stressed and especially the or organic coffee was this way that it didn't just kick you in in the face it slowly got you uh, up there and it was a very pleasant feeling and it wasn't as strong as the coffee from gross and grocery stores but still after one week of drinking it uh, I would get bad reactions bad uh, results and a, a lot of stress and if the normal coffee the everyday coffee took me three days to get addicted to it for that it was something around seven days again wow yeah, but it was not and it is not the case for everyone for right. me it is and right for me it, i am a person who should have avoided and on some days i well, even yeah. avoid green tea because that is even too much burden on me well and the other thing too you have to think about is i didn't even think Remember, this part is the sleep part. From what I understand, and I don't know how common this is for people to have this issue, but there are some people who it takes days to metabolize the, the caffeine part of it, of the coffee. Mm -hmm. And that's like, that's if, if you do it every day and it takes that long to get out of your system, holy crap, you're just constantly bombarding your system, uh, making big, huge stressors there. And of course it's going to impact your sleep. And then people are like, but I just I drank coffee in the morning. It should be no big deal. I have one cup. Well, it could be affecting your sleep. Yes. One cup for certain people could be enough to mess up their sleep. And if you don't have adequate quality sleep, your health is just not going to be able to be optimal and it's going to affect so many things that that should be the big base of the pyramid right there you know quality sleep and stress management are two yeah. things that i see more than anything that's like oh my goodness if you were to change well i mean obviously diet's a big thing too but you know <laughs> some of these other things so yes coffee can also affect sleep really can uh, let's move on to heart health after eating so much fat and meat uh, aren't you dying from i mean uh, some heart problems or anything and have you had done a blood work done or a cat scan or something like that and do you know where you stand with respect to heart health Okay. Well, um, when, uh, before I started keto, I was on five medications, five, four blood pressure. One of them was a diuretic. Yeah. Five. 
And as I went through keto, I was able to kind of, I guess, like, I, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll say the story when I was like, I want to say it was like my early forties, maybe I had a major health scare mm -hmm. and I, I had this where I couldn't even change the kitty litter without having to rest for, you know, 30 minutes to an hour. I couldn't walk from my door to the car walking upstairs. Oh my gosh. It was horrible. And I knew, I knew I had an issue. I knew something was wrong. And I thought it was my heart, like, you know, having uh, about to have a heart attack or whatever. So I did something really stupid. I started taking baby aspirins because as you hear about doing that, you know, to make sure your blood is thin. And so you don't yeah. have a heart attack, you know, kind of thing. So I did that because I was so scared. Okay. Anyway. So I, I knew, I knew I had an issue, but I didn't want to admit it. And I had a very healthy mistrust of doctors from a very young age. And I'm not exactly sure why I think something happened that maybe I don't really fully subconsciously you know, maybe in my subconscious, I don't know. I'm just guessing, but I've always had an issue. And so I would not go to the doctor. I just, I wouldn't not, wouldn't do it. And I didn't want the doctor to tell me it's because you're fat. Well, duh, I know I'm fat. Thank you. You know, I didn't want to hear that because that was so hurtful. So that, that scared me more than having a heart attack. Don't ask me why, but it did. So I didn't go to the doctor anyway. <laughs> Something happened and I can't remember what it was. It was something very minute, but it was non-threatening. And so I went to the doctor to have it looked at. It was no big deal. I can't, you know, it was nothing. I can't even remember. And they do the normal thing where they check your blood pressure, et cetera, right? They took my blood pressure and they were like, oh, okay. We're going to need for you to lay back and relax. Don't stress. And I'm like, what do you mean? Don't stress. You know, mm -hmm. next thing you know, they're willing in the EKG machine. The doctor's coming in. The nurse is coming in. The assistants are coming in. I had a room full of people and I'm like, what is the deal? And they're like, oh, okay, your blood pressure is absolutely at stroke level right now. And we are very concerned. And here's some medication. If it's not down in 30 minutes, you will be admitted to the hospital. And I was like, Oh, okay. <laughs> and then that led me to having to go see a cardiologist and doing the stress test, et cetera. That's when I got put on the five different medications. Five, five, five. And uh, so that's how I started when I was on, uh, you know, keto and then with the weight loss and the change of diet and all that, I was able to get off all the medication, but the one, like I said, and then when I went carnivore, I was able to get off that one. Okay. So you're wondering, have I ever had a CAT scan or the calcium arterial um, thing? No, I have not. But I, because of what I do, I, I've been lucky to have companies send me products to try. And so I tested my cholesterol and the full panel stuff when you're dealing with cholesterol three different times. And they were spread out, you know, over, I don't know, probably six months, something like that. And each one of them was very similar. Okay. So my LDL was slightly elevated. I can't remember the number now, but my HDL was 99 HDL 99 and my triggs were 74. So when you take the ratio, you divide mm -hmm. uh, the HDL into your triggs. That's a better indicator than, oh, your LDL. Oh my God. You know, and that's a 0.74. Anything under a two is good. Under one is optimal. So after seeing that three different times, three different companies, three different time periods, I was like, I'm good. And I was no longer, you know, pre-diabetic. I no longer had high blood pressure. I no longer had all these other issues. So the comorbidities were gone too. So here I have this awesome cholesterol score and I also don't have the comorbidities. So I haven't done anything farther than that, but eventually I'll do the CAC thing, you know, the CAC score, whatever you call it. But yeah, so far, I mean, everything seems to be good. Yeah, and something about your Instagram handle, uh, Lone Star Keto, Keto Girl. Uh, when I saw the Lone Star, it uh, after some times it reminded me of that tick. 
that is also called Lone Star. Oh, Tick, Lone yeah? Star Tick, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's scary for us who meat eaters that what happens if we are bitten by that tick? Yeah. What would we do? I would be really upset. <laughs> now, generally, that is temporary, but uh, I think there have been cases where it's lasted a long time. Oh, so that so would be that would be horrifying. Yeah, that that's it, it yeah. seems to be the the general thing is, I mean, some obviously it takes longer than others, but um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, eventually you should be able to probably eat meat again. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that would be horrifying for me. I would be like, okay, so I would fast I through it. <laughs> I know it's like, hmm, how long can I fast without, yeah, having any harm done to me? <laughs> <laughs> how much body fat do i have that i can use <laughs> oh yeah speaking of which when i started um keto in the beginning i had something like 20 kilograms i think it is 40 pounds i hope i haven't missed the conversion um and in the beginning when i started it my hypothesis is this that because of the body fat that i had I could go longer hours without food, without feeling hungry. Uh, when I first saw your uh, transformation video, mm, I could see, uh, um, well, I know you as uh, uh, the Lone Star Keto Girl. And I thought that you were just posting an example of the people who you have helped. And then I realized that it is you. Uh, that was great mind-blowing transformation that's impressive how, how you, you've done that there are some more questions that i have and mm -hmm. uh one thing I, I would like to know in the beginning with more body fat did you feel the same thing and after you lost the extra weight do you feel hungry more often than the beginning no um mm -hmm. that is something that i never experienced because you know, w when I did go keto, you know, I, I started running off ketones. And so whether it was from the fat I ate or the, the, the stuff I still had on my body, whatever, um, it, it kept me very satiated, extremely satiated. So I never felt hunger. I never felt hunger. Now, when I, um, this is interesting. And I've heard other people say this too, is when I, um, kind of made the transformation or the, when I started going more towards carnivore, I did find that I was more hungry. And that seems to be kind of more of an indication that you have been restricting certain nutrients. And even on keto, I was scared to death to overdo the protein because, oh my God, I might get kicked out of ketosis. Oh my God. You know, so you're told don't eat too much protein. Just, you know, definitely eat what, you know, you're, you're supposed to, your limit, whatever, but don't go too much over that because you might get kicked out of ketosis. So that scared me because, oh my gosh, I didn't want to be out of ketosis because I love being in ketosis. So that was a big thing. So when I, I went to carnivore, Carnivore, I have a feeling that I was lacking protein. I really was. Mm -hmm. I needed some amino acids more, more than. And so when I started giving my body that, my body was like, yeehaw. All right, let's go. Okay. So I'm going to ramp this up a little bit. I want you to keep eating that stuff till I feel like you're not going to starve me again. And eventually my appetite did kind of, you know, level off. And now I don't have a big appetite anymore. It's just like my body's kind of content where it's at. Um, you know, I eat a pound to a pound and a fourth of meat. And some people think that's not enough, but I'm five foot two. I mean, I'm not super active. I mean, you know, it's like, that's a fine amount for me. So, yeah. By the way, do you exercise? Do you do any kind of resistance training or any kind of exercise? Oh. And if you do... I'm bad. Okay. I'll, I'll admit it. That's my weakness. It's just my weakness. And I, I will, without using that as an excuse, I'm just saying, um, I did suffer from exercise disorders mm -hmm. Yeah, I and, um, it, it, it was very severe. I would work out pretty much seven days a week, sometimes six, but mostly seven days a week for two to five hours a day. I went to, I think it was four different gyms to make sure I hit every class that I needed. And that's what I did all day long, going to different gyms, working out. And when I was at home, 
I would run up and down the hallway. I had a step box in front of the TV and every commercial I would do steps as steps or run up and down the hallway or jumping jacks or, you know, weightlifting or, or doing pull-ups. And I had a pull-up bar in the doorway. I would do these crazy things constantly. I could never not do something or I, I it would just upset me or I would get on my treadmill if it, you know, I, I couldn't do something outside, whatever. So I get on my treadmill, I do 10 miles on my treadmill. I mean, that was just typical for me. So I'm one of these people who I'm either 500% or I'm 0%. There is no gray. I do not do gray. I don't like gray. Don't work for me, whatever. You know, you kind of need to be in the gray. Yeah, I don't work that way. So once I kind of realized that I had a problem and I kind of was forced into the realization when I got injured multiple times Mm -hmm. and I was like, okay, And then as I was unable to do anything and I realized how that made me feel the panic, the, you know, oh my God, I'm going to get fat. Oh my God. uh, uh, uh." You know, I was freaking out because I couldn't do something every waking moment of the day. And that's when I realized I really had a problem anyway. So, you know, many years um, that really sticks in my head and it makes me a little fearful to go to extreme. So I've kind of held back and it sounds like an excuse and it may be, but, um, it, it's kind of one of those things that I do fear because I know that it's, it, it's right there. And I, I understand how to deal with my sugar addiction, but I don't quite fully understand how to maneuver that part. So anyway, getting back into like, say a gym situation or, you know, taking classes again, doing the extreme stuff, I, I, I just won't do what I do is walk, which is excellent. And occasionally I do some kettlebell work. Do I need to do more resistant exercises? Yes, I do. And do I recommend that to my clients? Absolutely. And I need to really work on that. That I will tell you is my weakness. That is my weakness. So, um, it's, and, and I think it's a mental block partly and the other part, you know, <laughs> I I don't have enough hours in the day as it is. And I know everybody says, oh, what's important to you? Blah. Well, I'm starting a business. I take care of my three-year-old granddaughter. I babysit my granddaughter dog. I have, you know, all these things going on. Podcasts, I got this, I got that. So yeah, I actually really do have a time problem. Um, But yeah, I I, I need to work on it. I'm trying to work my way back there. But yes, it's absolutely essential to good health. Yes. Uh, when I look at the timeline uh, that you started keto, and I think you also mentioned it, that it was after menopause. I want to know, um, did you do anything differently from the women around you who hadn't uh, hit menopause still? Uh, <laughs> okay, menopause. Okay, this this is kind of a tricky thing for me because I had a procedure uh, in my like mid early forties, I think, I can't remember what year it was. Um, it's called Novasure. Basically it's, um, I think it's called emblazion or whatever they go in and they burn out your uterus. Oh yeah. yeah. And so okay. my uterus was completely burned out. Mm-hmm. So in other words, I don't have a period and hadn't had one in a very long time. So I have no clue if I'm in menopause or not. And I still don't, I don't have hot flashes. I don't, I, I have had zero issues that a menopausal woman complains about. So either I have not ever entered it or because of the dietary and lifestyle changes I made, that is just not that in my face. I don't know. I can't tell Mm. you. I I haven't, again, like I said, I have this thing about doctors and there's some great doctors out there. I'm not trying to bash doctors, but it's just not my thing. And so if I, I can avoid it, I will. I know I'm terrible. I do. But, um, so I, I haven't been tested for, um, you know, to see if I'm actually in menopause. I've had some hormone testing done, um, through the kits that get sent to me, but, it's never come back saying necessarily that I was, you know, in menopause, it it doesn't really read it like that, or at least I didn't know how to read it to be able to see if that was something that, you know, I mean, I've had my testosterone and my estrogen, that kind of thing tested, but yeah. So Mm -hmm. I honestly don't really know, but I've had no issues. So I, 
you know, maybe tomorrow, all of a sudden I'm going to get hot flashes. I don't know, but you know, I just turned 56 and I've had zero issues. So. I remember one of your tweets from maybe one, one year ago or even more. You were talking about your experiments with honey and uh, you found it too sweet and you couldn't believe that it was that sweet and how could people eat that. Could you uh, tell us more about your sugar experiments? Yeah. Yeah, this, this, this is a, kind of an interesting thing because it's such a controversial thing in the carnivore mm-hmm. community right now. You know, number one, is it an animal-based food? Okay, I'm just going to come out and say, no, okay, mm-hmm. an animal made it, but it's not an animal food. You know what I mean? It's like, you can, or, uh, I, I'm just, no. Um, now, whether or not you include it, hey, that's your business. I, you know, <clears throat> if it works for you, you don't have metabolic issues and you're not a a sugar addict. Okay. Maybe it gives you benefits. That's great. Awesome. Yay. Go for you. Um, when, before I ever got on keto and I was doing all these different, uh, diets and stuff, thinking that I'm eating healthy. One of the things I would have, (laughs) okay. First of all, for breakfast, I would have oatmeal with fruit, a banana, skim milk and margarine. (laughs) Oh yes. Isn't that awesome? And then for lunch, I would have on this God awful toast that was, you know, 35 calorie toast or something that was, you know, whole wheat or something. And I would mix honey with peanut butter, you know, peanut butter is healthy protein, right? Lots of protein, good stuff. And then I'd mix it with our local honey, um, uh, and, and put it on the toast. And that's what I eat peanut butter and honey sandwiches every day for mm-hmm. years because I loved it. So I went through, you know, a thing of, you know, your typical size of honey, <laughs> probably in a week. I mean, that's how much honey. I, okay. So you can kind of understand where I'm coming from. I love my honey and I, I love my oatmeal too. I ain't gonna lie. Um, okay. So when I went keto, obviously I, I didn't eat that anymore. And, um, I did a CGM experiment after going carnivore. So like you said, it was probably a year ago or something like that. And I wore one and I decided I want to see what, the things that I used to eat, how it affects me. And one of the things I tried was honey and I did try honey on its own. I didn't try it with the peanut butter. Maybe that would have dampened the effects a little bit. I don't know. Um, but I just was curious how having a hit of honey, like say if you added it to your coffee or something. So I took just one tablespoon of honey, that's it. Just one tablespoon. And I think two tablespoons was a serving. So I just did one and I felt awful, just awful. I felt like, I'm not even sure what the right word is. I felt very, um, lightheaded, nauseous, um, shaky. Um, it was an awful feeling. And it also made me feel very anxious, like, like great anxiety and, and, and I'm paranoid. It was weird. And when I looked at my CGM, holy cow, well, no wonder it's, spiked way up to way up past where, you know, the, the line is way up. And then it went kaboom and it cratered and Mm -hmm. it was way low. Um, like my blood sugar was super low and that's where my shakiness, you know, was really starting because I was hypoglycemic at that point. Right. And so then you start to shake and and you, and you, you feel like you, you have to eat something or do something. And I mean, I was literally like this, And I was like, yeah, okay, honey's not, not, not going to work for me. Not going to work for me. Even though I am no longer insulin resistant necessarily, it still affects me now for other people. Yay. Good for you. Go eat that honey, whatever, go. It doesn't work for me. And not to mention the fact that that sweetness, any sweetness triggers Mm -hmm. sugar addiction and can cause a relapse. You just don't know what bite it will be. Will it be the first bite? Will it be the, you know, 1010th bite. You don't know, but eventually it will cause a relapse. So for me, honey is a no-go. No. Yeah. And uh, talking about whether it is carnivore or not, it is not actually produced by an animal. It, the animal just eats it and um, just uh, throws up the thing. Yeah. It has eaten. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, for yeah, example, ruminating yeah. animals, if they eat something when they are ruminating it, is it going to become 
something plant based uh, no. right right oh, right or yeah. something animal based well it is coming from the plant directly for most or maybe all ruminating animals so it is not going to make it carnivore and the other thing is yeah as you mentioned uh, it can trigger sh- sugar addiction i mm. do not recognize a big sugar addiction in, in myself but when I experimented with honey, I realized that I tended to go to the aisles and shelves that I normally didn't have any uh, any motivation or any interest in going to before. Uh, the other thing that I can say about that is that, for example, you say that uh, one uh, teaspoon is okay. It's very difficult to eat it after getting used to it actually in the beginning my experience was exactly like yours i didn't have a cgm i had these glucometers that you need to prick your fingers Mm -hmm. to test and it went over 200 and it was something unbelievable for me my pastry had not been that level at all wow that's that's higher than mine (laughs) yeah that that was a huge level i mean it came no honey for you (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> no honey for me no honey for me and then I was hungry um, badly and the shaking mm-hmm. as you said and you cannot stop just as at that uh, when you get used to it you cannot stop at one tablespoon uh, tablespoon or two and you will eat through the the half of the half of the jar and no, oh, it's easy to do. Yeah. Easy Especially if you're a sugar addict. Oh yeah. Yeah. I love yeah. me some honey. I'm not going to lie. I love me some honey. And you know, I, I've had people come at me like, well, it's because you didn't eat it with something else. Okay. So why are you trying to figure out a way for me to include it in my diet? <laughs> when obviously my body is like, yeah, I don't think so. So why play tricks so you can eat something that you know is not good for your body for this sugar addiction issue part of it or for my body, period, because it just doesn't do well with that kind of thing. So I don't really understand why people feel the need to, oh, well, you could eat rice if you put it in the refrigerator first and you know then rewarm it the next day. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. It, it, it does for a lot of people, it does make a big difference. I've seen, you know, some experiments on it and that's pretty cool. It's something I haven't done, but, um, why, why, why do I want to try to include a grain that is really not going to benefit me? You, you know, it's like, why do I need to play these tricks to continue my addiction to certain foods? Yeah, no, you can play with it altogether. Yeah, exactly. That's kind of where I'm at. And I mean, if it doesn't bother you and you can deal with it or whatever, you know, more power to you. I'm not going to tell you not to eat it. It's not my business. And not everybody needs to go carnivore. Not everybody needs to uh, totally, you know, eliminate a, a food group, if you will. Um, or, or, you know, some people can actually even, you know, moderate certain things. Yay, good for you. I'm not a moderator. I already know that. I can't do it. Mm-hmm. I'm an addict. I can't do it. So, <laughs> you know, it just kind of depends on your unique situation. And there are people who can do it. I call them white unicorns, but they exist. Hate them, but no, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Right. And let's go back to the, um, to something that you mentioned in the beginning of the interview and also in other interviews, the acid reflux. Mm-hmm. Uh, you mentioned that your acid reflux was so intense that you would lie down and the acid would actually come mm-hmm. to your mouth. Mm-hmm. Did it affect your uh, tooth health in any way? Oh boy. Okay. Yes. Acid from your stomach. Absolutely. So between the period of time where I was bulimic and I was literally puking up my stomach contents Mm. with the acid and then having the acid almost daily come up into my mouth, um, I absolutely believe it damaged my teeth. And what ended up happening was my molar started to crumble. And that's where my issue was. And 
<laughs> I'm not a fan of dentist either. I'll just admit, I don't know what my issue is, but <laughs> I just don't like going to, to, you know, things like that. And so I let it get really bad until there was such an infection. My jaw was like this. Mm. And I went to the dentist and they had to pull it. Uh, sorry, tooth, sorry, sorry. But now I have an implant and I had to have uh, this tooth up here and this one down here pulled. They're still, because they have no teeth, you know, together. The dentist said, you know what, don't worry about it. So it's my very back one. So I'm not messing with that. So I don't have any teeth back on this side. And then I had to have um, a crown on uh, one back here. And then this one up here, I, I had to, it, not quite a crown. It wasn't technically a crown, but because there was starting to show a lot of issues, he kind of like basically did a crown kind of sort of. So I've had a lot of dental work, a lot of dental work. And I absolutely believe that. And I also feel like the food I was eating contributed the rest, you know, kind of finished it off. Uh, all the, the sugars and the different foods, the, the carbs and the processed carbs specifically, I'm not talking about, you know, vegetables, whatever, but, um, it, it yes, it did. Absolutely. And the, the acid reflux, I will just say was one of the most miserable things that I've had to deal with. And, um, the interesting thing is it, I had heard at the time where I, I was going keto. So I was already doing keto for a while and I wanted off Nexium. I was on Nexium for eight years every day. And if I didn't take it, I would literally be gagging on acid. I mean, bad. And it would burn my throat. My throat would just be just raw from all the acid. Mm -hmm. And, um, as a matter of fact, I had a rotor rooter where they went in when up there, you know, to kind of see what was going on. And, um, it, it, the person who did it was like, yeah, it looks like hamburger meat from here all the way through your system. Yeah. So it was bad. And, um, I had heard that the issue was really that for most people it was that you had too little stomach acid, not too much. So here I was for eight years taking medication that turned off the acid pumps or, or reduced the acid pumps. So I wasn't able to digest my food properly mm -hmm. and absorb the nutrients I needed to absorb. So no wonder I had so many issues, right? But by having such a low stomach acid, it really affects that flap at the top of your stomach between your stomach and your esophagus and it allows acid to come up so you think you have too much acid that's not it so after hearing that i was like oh there's no way and they said to try apple cider vinegar and i was like oh my god this is gonna be bad this is gonna be bad because i already was so raw so i did i took the apple cider vinegar and i'm not gonna lie it burned it burned because it was so raw but it made a difference and then i was able to wean off my nexium now I understand fully why that happens and what's going on with that. And, um, that you can also use, um, HCL betaine hydrochloric acid, basically to get your stomach acid where it needs to be. Mm -hmm. So if you suffer from acid reflux, it could be because you have too low stomach acid. I know it sounds so crazy, especially when you're gagging on acid, but it, it is true. And you said that you discovered the reason why it, it happened. What was the reason that it was uh, happening for you? Processed foods. Mm -hmm. That's a big one. Alcohol, stress, and um, drinking too much fluid with your meals or, or too close to it. So it dilutes oh, the stomach acid. Yeah. So, yeah. And there, there are other reasons too, but those are the, the big ones. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about your last post on instagram that just before this interview i happened to see it oh, no. it was about uh, calorie restriction uh, uh, i have become kind of allergic to the word calorie i don't say that it, it does not matter but it is just you know the energy part of the equation mm -hmm. and we are not a closed system that is another important factor but generally looking at it as a kind of uh, measure, as a kind of base for measuring how much we should eat, how, when we should stop. I think that's a terrible idea. 
what's your view on that and how do you see calories and the idea of calories in calories out I detest it. Nice. <laughs> detest it. Because, <laughs> yeah. I mean, do calories matter? Sure. Yes. I'm not going to say they don't matter. That is not what I mean at all. Obviously, they're, they play a part. Yes. However, counting them, there is a subset of people who I will say that you kind of, for those who are serious binge eaters, they can't control their appetite. So they need some kind of measurement, whether it's, you know, you're allowed a certain amount of food and you have to weigh it or you count the calories. Okay. So there is a subset that I think really needs it. And I also think calorie counting is a good thing to do when you're first starting something. So you can make sure you're not under eating. It's not about, <laughs> oh, let's balance the calories. No, it, it's to make sure that you're not eating too low, especially when you're on, you know, low carb keto carnivore, because your appetite tends to really, you know, go down because you're so satiated. So you may find yourself and for me, it was pretty constant 1200 calories. Well, that's like a little kid calories, you know? So it's good to kind of have that information, do it for a short period of time or whatever to kind of see, but to try to calculate, I'm going to tell you what, I was so obsessed with it back in the day when I was trying everything. And people will say, well, if it doesn't work, it's because you, you know, were sneaking bites. You didn't count. Um, hello. I am the most obsessive person you'll come across my husband always says I have OCD, but you know, I'm, I'm not clinically diagnosed or anything, but mm -hmm. I will like analyze the crap out of everything. And I would measure if it was a bite, I would measure the freaking bite. I mean, I did that. I did it. And nobody can tell me I didn't because I did. And, you know, the exercise, I wore a band here, wore one here, and I, I would subtract a certain amount. Like if it said I burned 400 calories, I would half it and say I only burned 200. And when I was counting the calories, I would add just in case somewhere along the line, I messed something up. So I was over counting my calorie or under counting my calories over count or, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I think I said that backwards, whatever. Um, just, just to kind of balance or whatever. I was that obsessive about it. What did it get me? Okay. Yeah. I lost the weight. Big deal. Big deal. I lost the weight. Big deal because I couldn't keep it off because that didn't teach me anything. It didn't, um, show me how to stay satiated. So I didn't have to be so freaking miserable and, and measure all this stuff. I wasn't eating the correct food to give my body the nutrients it needed to where my body goes, you know what? You're good. You're good. I think we can cut it off now because I physically cannot overeat meat. I can't, there are some people with binge eating disorders who can. Okay. I'm so we always really got to say that. See them. Yeah. It's interesting. I physically can't. I tried. I've tried because, you know, going to the Brazilian restaurant, you're like, I'm getting my money's worth by golly. <laughs> yeah, I don't. Not even close. I don't. I don't even. So, you know, I, I that blows my mind, but there are people who, who do have that issue. So there oh. are. But generally speaking, you know, when you're you're satiated, you don't really have to worry about the calorie thing. And, and if you're not eating the hyper palatable food that keeps you you know, that just jacks your hunger signals, then, you know, you, you don't need to worry about calories like that. If you're eating correctly and you don't have certain issues, I mean, there's always exceptions, but, um, for the most part, I just find that it is just ridiculous because there's so much more to the equation. We are not a freaking calculator. We have hor hormones, especially women. Oh, please. <laughs> I don't, you can come at me all you want to, but you can be in a calorie deficit go ahead, come at me. Come on, come at me. I don't care. You can have a calorie deficit and not lose weight. What? Oh, and, but the sicko people will tell you is because you didn't count correctly. You, you didn't count those bites. Well, I'm calling bullshit on that because I did. I know I did. I'm obsessive as hell. So, you know, I know that that that's wrong, but that's what you hear. 
And that is so indoctrinated in us that it's become this big thing. But there's so many other things to think about that you, you, you have to have proper digestion so you can, you know, absorb the nutrients you need. You have to have your stomach acid at, a, you know, a, a certain place, you, your bile, your liver, your, your gallbladder, that all has to be working correctly to break things down, to be able to absorb it. You have hormones that need to be balanced. You know, there's, there's so much more to it than just calories. Good gosh. That is to me, the most destructive one of the most destructive things. The other thing I detest is the eat less, move more. Mm -hmm. When I hear that, I really want to smack somebody because yeah. that damaged me horribly mm -hmm. because I bought into that. And again, let's talk about character flaw here. You know, I thought, well, gosh, I, I, I just, I'm, I'm eating too much. Oh my gosh, I'm not moving enough. So here I was, you know, seven days a week, Five, two to five hours a day exercising. And we're talking intense exercising, not just little and eh, eh stuff. And I got down to 800 calories. Wow. But I stopped losing weight. Wait, what? Eat less, move more. Calories in, calories out. That's all that matters, right? Hmm. So what happened to me? So yeah, no, I don't buy it. Do they matter? Yes. Yes, they do matter. But is that all of the equation? No, it's like a very small part. And it was thought prov provoking and interesting to, uh, that you said that you are not using it as a measure to tell people to eat less. It is actually for making sure that they are eating enough. more, enough. Yeah. Enough. Uh -huh. And uh, this maxim, this uh, dogma of eat less, move more calories in calories out uh, this has led so so many people into frustration and i was watching uh, an interview with a woman who was an influencer and she was obese maybe you have even uh, uh, you you've also come across that uh, because it had a really high view and the woman was very famous and the channel was famous but i don't remember the name of the interviewer and all and she was obese, she was young, 40 something, or maybe even less than 40. And she was like, I have lived uh, and I have experienced so many things. You're telling me that I'm obese and I might die. Well, I have seen so many things. I wouldn't regret it if I die young. So you can see the amount of frustration when someone around the age of 40 would say that. And she's and the interviewer asked her, uh, "Why wouldn't you diet if when you know that it is not going to be healthy for you, and uh, you you most probably are going to die young?" She said, "Why would I do that if all the um, most of the diets just fail? Well, all of them are based on this dogma: calories in, calories out. Of course, they would fail because you can eat." bread and you can't ca uh, count the calories and you can eat eggs and eat a certain amount that is equal to that amount of bread but you may lose weight i think this uh, dogma is doing a great disservice to so many people and very making much so frustrated yeah matter of fact i have this little prop Okay, y'all look, look, and no, I did not eat this. I did not eat this. <laughs> but I use it as a prop because uh -huh. I see, I like to, to you know, be entertained with TikTok occasionally, okay? Mm -hmm. And um, I see all these influencers, these little cutesy little 20 year old little in their little outfits mm -hmm. and they, they're showing their little food and they're like, you don't have to give up whole macros to look like these. And I'm like, you're 20 talk to me in about 10 years. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. And just because it's not showing on your outside. Okay. Yeah. Doesn't mean it's not doing damage on the inside. So come talk to me in 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> and it, that drives me nuts because people want to hear that. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. What I say, mm -hmm. what I teach, people don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear it because it forces them to have to examine that maybe what they've been told, what they've been doing is not the right way. And that may mean they may have to give up something that they love. 
that they're addicted to, that they have to admit they have an issue. So that's a big, huge problem. And then you just give somebody permission. You don't have to give this up. You just eat less. You just moderate it. Okay. First of all, what is moderation? Define moderation that fits for everybody. For what you can moderate is going to be different than what my moderation looks like. So it is undefinable per person, you know, as, as a, you know, yes, yeah, you can define the Webster, you know, whatever definition, but it doesn't apply to everybody. It, you can't say, oh, 20 grams of carbs is, you know, the perfect amount for everybody or whatever. No, you can't do that. You just can't do that. And so that, that moderate, oh my God, no, you don't give up. Anybody who tells you to give up food doesn't know what they're talking about. Okay. Okay. So I guess somebody who is an alcoholic shouldn't have to give up their booze either. Right? Right. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. It's just all about moderating it because it's that easy. When you have an addictive brain, it's so easy to just moderate. Sure. Yeah. Really that makes me really, really <laughs> aggravated because <laughs> I'm like, people listen to you. They want to look like you. So you may even be doing something completely different behind the scenes. And so what you're out there blabbing about, oh, you can look so cute like me because uh, I eat cookies, you know, <laughs> it's like, no, just no, that you just harm somebody. You just really harm somebody because they want to hear that. They want to buy into it. They want to follow that advice. And then when that advice doesn't work, guess what? You're blamed. Because you didn't eat less enough or more, move more enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's my favorite part about it because they have a built in excuse when something doesn't work. It's your Mm -hmm. fault. It's not my bad advice. It's your fault because you didn't do, you didn't eat enough less, you know? Yeah. How much more or less than, for example, 800 calories per day? I didn't imagine yeah. that. How much food would, See, would that be? You know? That's what that's what I that that's what I keep saying is how much more did you expect me to move? Twenty four hours a day. So when I'm seventy, because you have to keep upping your game, right? Mm-hmm. You have to keep reducing your calories. You have to keep upping it to have any effect, right? Because you keep doing the same thing and it loses its effect, right? Yeah, we all know that. Mm-hmm. So by the time I'm seventy. I'm not going to be sleeping because I'm going to be on a treadmill 24 hours a day and I'm going to be eating a piece of lettuce. That advice is awful. Just awful, awful, awful advice. And it's harmed so many people. Yeah. Yeah. And during the interview, I realized that you we shared the uh, hatred for the word gray and also moderation. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, not a fan. <laughs> not, a fan. <laughs> not a fan at all. Yeah. Not a fan. Yeah, my husband wished I would be more in the gray area sometimes, but yeah, I don't really work that way. <laughs> yeah, true. It's my strength and my weakness. Because mm-hmm. when I do go for something, oh, I go for it, and I'm gonna do it. And you better all just in. move on out the way. But if I'm not gonna fit, then yeah, it ain't gonna happen. It's just not gonna happen. <laughs> so it's eh, whatever extremism. I want to be respectful of your time first. Uh, do you, would you like to cover something else that didn't bring up the, during the interview? Hmm, I think we pretty much talked about most of the things that, you know, <laughs> moderation, I hate that, calories, <laughs> <laughs> sugar addiction is a huge passion of mine. Um, yeah, food pyramid, we kind of sort of talked about that, about the yeah. bad advice. So we talked about that. No, I think, I, I think, pretty much covered everything that that is utmost in my heart soul whatever cool and would you tell us uh, tell people how, how they can follow you and follow your work oh sure uh, i'm everywhere so you know uh, <laughs> i have lone star in there somewhere i've had to change up depending on the social media it's so annoying i wish they had the same character allowed oh. but on instagram it's lone star keto girl all one word um Twitter, it's lone underscore keto underscore, uh, I'm sorry, lone star keto and underscore between the words. Um, I have two websites. One is lone star keto.com. The other one is lone star nutrition therapy.com. That's my newest one. And it's got all, you know, my, what I'm doing now. Um, 
let's see, Instagram, let's see, Facebook. I have a group called Lone Star Keto. And then I also have a, um, um, a food addiction group that I've started have that there, but everything is on my website. So if you want to go to my website, mm-hmm. all the social media is on there. So great. Uh, thanks for agreeing to do this. And it Absolutely. was really, uh, really interesting. And I really enjoyed this talk. Well, thank you so much for having me on. It was fun. Sure. Thank you. Bye. Hope you've enjoyed this episode of Round the Fire. If you are watching this video on YouTube, Please give it a like and hit the subscribe button. If you're listening to the podcast, please leave the five star review. It would cost you nothing but help me a great deal, especially if you do so on Apple Podcasts. Also, if you feel particularly generous, consider supporting me via Patreon, PayPal, or Bitcoin.